In Africa, we had some resources. We have oil, gas, uranium, and so on. And uh, yeah, we lack money. So people come and say, we don't have resources, but we have money, <laughs> you see. And with MMT, yeah, you have the contrary point of view. You have resources already, and money is yeah. never an issue. The first thing you have to ask is, how do you resource that, not how do you fund it? And I think with this type of MMT mindset, we could achieve genuine progress. So when people say that MMT could not be applied to developing countries, I am against that point of view because MMT says look first at real resources and after that we talk about money. Do you have real resources? Good. You don't need foreign currency for that. If you have the real resources, you can build your schools, you can build your hospitals, you can give jobs to people. You do not need the IMF, you do not need the World Bank. This is the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Hi, I'm Christian Riley, and welcome to the Modern Monetary Theory Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can support the show by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. For as little as a dollar a month, you can get early access to all our episodes and patron-only episodes. A big thank you to all our supporters so far. At the beginning there, you heard Senegalese economist and author Ndongo Sambasila. And we're going to be talking to him in a moment about the political challenges that arise in countries with governments that do not control the issuance of their own national currency, such as the 14 nations of Francophone Africa that use the CFA franc, which Ndongo and his co-author Fanny Pijo refer to as Africa's last colonial currency. If this is your first time hearing about MMT, you might want to listen to our first three episodes for an introduction. But if you want to dive in here, the concept we'll be talking a lot about in this conversation is something called monetary sovereignty. And on that topic, drawing on the work of our regular guest, Professor Fidel Kaboob, a country can be said to be monetarily sovereign if it fulfills four criteria. One, that it issues its own currency through its legal and institutional structure. Two, that it imposes tax obligations denominated in that currency. And note that a country that issues its own currency must issue that currency first before there can be any of it out there in the hands of people like you and me in the private sector in order for us to be able to pay any taxes. This is a key insight into the way modern money systems operate, and it changes the way we understand government spending. The sequence, the life cycle of government-issued money is that it's spent into existence first before it's taxed back, not the other way around. It sounds counterintuitive, but it really is beyond dispute. The third pillar of monetary sovereignty is that the currency the government issues needs to be a floating exchange rate currency, meaning that units of this currency are not promises to deliver some fixed quantity of another currency or of a precious metal such as gold. Self-imposed constraints like these limit a government's policy options. Now, some people would argue in favour of constraining government in this way, but I think a nation's more democratic when it's limited by the will of its people rather than by how much gold it has buried in a hole in the ground somewhere. The fourth factor in determining whether a nation has full monetary sovereignty or not is its level of foreign-denominated debt. For instance, the so-called debt issued by nations such as the UK or the US is denominated in their respective national currencies. UK government bonds, also known as gilts, are promises to pay pounds, and pounds are issued by the UK government, so there's no risk of involuntary default for countries like this that issue debt denominated in their own currency. But there are other nations that meet those first three criteria for monetary sovereignty that don't meet this last one. And so a nation that has debts denominated in a currency that it doesn't issue can be said to have a lower degree of monetary sovereignty. 
For more detail on this, you can check out our episode 12 with Fidel Kaboob, which I've linked to in the show notes, along with links to, among other things, where you can get hold of Nadongo and Fanny's book about the CFA Frank, and as ever, to where you can support this podcast financially via patreon.com slash mmtpodcast. Support starts at a dollar a month, which is 70 British pence at the time of recording, and no matter what level of support you give, you get early access to all of our episodes and patron-only episodes where you can ask me and Patricia MMT questions. We are 100% listener-supported. Your financial support really helps keep this show going, and your support in other ways, whether it's by recommending us to other people or just by listening and spreading the word about this stuff, really helps too. So thanks for the time you put into understanding MMT. Let's dive in. Welcome one and all to the MMT podcast. I'm Christian Riley. And I'm Patricia Pino. And it's our pleasure to welcome to the MMT podcast, Senegalese development economist and co-author of Africa's Last Colonial Currency, the CFA Frank story, Ndongo Sambasila. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing well. And you? Just delighted to have you. Yeah. Thank you for the invitation. Ndongo, could you tell us how you first came to MMT? The first time I heard about MMT, I think, was in uh, 2017. I was in Brussels, I think, uh, for a um, professional trip. And I have a colleague from the Tunis office who told me about uh, MMT. He told me, you are doing research on the CFA franc. Uh, you are interested in monetary sovereignty. I think you should have a look at, um, at MMT. It all started from there. Was it quite a big shock? Did you, did you come from, from the mainstream kind of thinking and, and slowly go east into MMT? Or was this kind of big moment of realization? And- I would say it was a big moment of joy. I was really happy to find an uh, approach, economic approach, saying that monetary sovereignty is really important. Uh, because even among our comrades, <laughs> Marxist comrades, sometimes they could say, oh, no, it's not important. You have to look at other spheres, uh, relationships of productions, etc. Uh, God governance is important, so let's talk first about God governance, and after that we'll talk about monetary sovereignty, etc. So uh, when I read this literature, I was really happy to see a bold approach saying that monetary sovereignty is important. And also I was really happy also to discover many things, because for example, the idea that uh, you have to spend first before collecting taxes, things which were not obvious for, for, for me. For example, the idea of functional finance, all those things I discovered with uh, the MMT uh, literature. So regarding the MMT literature, can you remember your first, uh, you know, what was the first text that, that, that uh, got you into it? I think it was the New Economic Perspective block. I think I have read the whole block. And also I um, uh, bought the uh, books by Randall Ray because before they published uh, Macroeconomics, there was another book, uh, the uh, manual they published. I have it here. Randall Ray and Bill Mitchell and also um, Martin Watts, yeah. So it's the Modern Monetary Theory and Practice, an introductory text. What was that? If I, if I, am I mistaken to say that was kind of the first textbook probably of, of MMT? Right? Yeah, I think it was the first textbook. <laughs> So tell us about being advisor to the president of Senegal. It has been really um, special because um, normally um, African presidents do not need advisors. (laughs) 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 Yeah, because, yeah, they know what to decide because, yeah, they have their agenda as politicians. They already know all the answers. All the answers, yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. So maybe they have to fill a certain number of jobs. So (laughs) that's the thing. Uh, Because in fact, um, to be frank, intellectually, it was not really, um, let's say, uh, an interesting experience. Uh, Because uh, when you are an advisor, you are not uh, supposed to talk publicly. And at the same time, you see that in those kind of spheres, there are many uh, power games. And even when you want to defend progressive ideas or agenda, you will find other people defending, uh, let's say, uh, different uh, <coughs> ideas or agenda. So it's a really a very um, um, strange uh, setting. So what I have learned there is how the, um, how the Senegalese society function. And uh, in particular, uh, what kind of, uh, let's say, uh, progressive politics could be achieved 
uh, in those fields. Uh, from there, I got the feeling that, yeah, in fact, many people think that you have to be at the presidency to change things, but I don't think so after this experience. I think that, well, uh, if you want to be heard, you have to be, let's say, outside the formal spheres of power and try to, let's say, to contest things, to make, uh, to make some noise. But uh, in those uh, spheres of power, I think that there are many political games and uh, this somehow distorts, uh, let's say, the good faith of people like me who are innocent people. I don't come from any, let's say, politician background. I didn't come from a political party, but just as, uh, as they call us, a technocrat. And so try to do our best, but it was not easy because uh, there was also two kind of uh, legitimacy uh, because we did not come from the party, so somehow we are like uh, intruders, you see. While there were people who fought to, let's yeah, say, for, for the electoral win, and they were those people who could make the president get reelected, re you see. So there was those kind of consideration. So in, in those power spheres, it's not always about um, thinking seriously about development or, or change, unfortunately. There have been many positive things, but overall I do not think that you could change uh, uh, really society in being in those positions. That has been my personal experience. It's quite paradoxical, isn't it? You, you seem to be saying that you, you are, instead of being empowered by being in a position of power, in inverted commas, you're actually disempowered by, by that process. Yeah, yeah. Um, that, that has been my, my feeling because you could not uh, uh, talk freely, uh, write freely, because um, as an advisor, you have to have certain professional limits, you see. So you cannot be a public intellectual. And um, at the same time, you do not decide because you are just an, an advisor. So if you want to uh, make some ideas known to the public, you have to move out of those spheres, I think, because it's always a um, matter of negotiating. It reminds me of that thing that, that Roosevelt said, that, you know, uh, make me do it. Talking about the New Deal, you know, like it's like you're in charge of the country, <laughs> you're throwing it back on us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the quote. I agree with you. Now make me do it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think what they mean is make it easy for me to do it. Yeah, right. create the context where I can say this stuff. Yeah. So let's talk about the book, Africa's Last Colonial Currency, the CFA Frank story. So what does it mean to say that the CFA Frank is a colonial currency? Well, uh, first of all, it was born as a colonial currency because it has been uh, created in 1945, so just after Second World War. And um, it has been uh, created out of a devaluation of the French franc. So at that time, there was something called uh, monetary unity. That means um, uh, one currency for a whole empire. So it was the French franc which was uh, circulating under diverse forms uh, uh, in, the, um, in most of the parts of the French empire. Uh, so after the Second World War, the French economy was in ruins. Uh, the inflation rate was higher than in the colonies. And so the, um, the French franc had to be devalued, but the issue was, uh, should we have uh, a uniform devaluation rate so that uh, this principle of monetary unity would be maintained? Or uh, should we uh, have different rates of devaluation because um, the impacts of the war have been uneven uh, across territories uh, within the empire? So the later decision was taken in secret by the French Ministry of Finance. It was a provisional government, and they decided to create the so-called colonial francs, including the CFA franc, because there was another currency created at the same time as the CFA franc. It was uh, the Pacific franc. And the Pacific franc is still existing. It is used by, by three territories which are not politically sovereign, which are under the, let's say, tutelage of the French government. And uh, CFA member states are actually members of the Eurozone, although most people of Europe aren't aware of this. You know, can you talk about why that is and what the consequences are of that on those states and what lessons can be drawn to understand the Eurozone's 
permanent deflation. Yes, indeed. In fact, uh, w- when it was created, it was the single currency for the uh, French colonies uh, south of the Sahara, you see. And after the independence in the 1960s, uh, we had the two CFA franc. That means we had the same acronym with two different names. For example, in the West Africa, it is a form of the uh, financial community uh, for eight countries in uh, West Africa. Uh, for Central Africa, you have the front of the um, financial cooperation in Central Africa. So uh, six countries, you know, and each of the monetary union uh, has its own central bank. And um, normally, in fact, until uh, 1999, we, the um, CFA franc was packed to the, um, to the French franc. But uh, with the launch of the euro, the CFA franc has been packed to the to the euro, and the euro has been a very um, strong currency. When 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 I say strong currency, that means that uh, compared to the French franc, the euro is much stronger. Uh, the value of the euro in terms of dollar is uh, much stronger than the, the value of the French the, the French franc at that time in terms of dollar. While uh, African countries uh, receive their export income and most most of their foreign income in U.S. dollar, so that means that whenever the um, the euro appreciates uh, against the U.S. dollar, uh, the African countries are let's say losing income whenever they exchange their foreign currency, their foreign income in U.S. dollar against CFA franc. And that has been the pattern, let's say, between, let's say, 2002 and 2008. You could see during this period, the euro appreciated against the dollar, uh, let's say, 90%, 90%. That means, uh, yeah, uh, when you exchange your, your U.S. dollar with CFA franc, you are losing, let's say, uh, uh, in terms of uh, purchasing power domestic uh, processing power and that has been the, the story of the CFA franc because when you pack your, your currency well you have to defend this pack and uh, normally you could uh, defend it when you have a, a sufficient uh, let's say foreign income but that is not the case for most African countries using the CFA franc for example in West Africa uh, you see that except Cote d'Ivoire, which is an agricultural rich uh, uh, country, all the other countries, the, the seven others, they have been in a uh, position of, um, let's say, uh, chronic uh, debt, um, trade deficit. That means that their imports have been higher than their exports on a long-term basis. So that means that uh, those countries could not generate foreign income through trade. So they are obliged to try to attract, let's say, uh, uh, financial flows, be it uh, foreign debt uh, investment or debt in foreign currency. And that has been their model of development. That means to to defend the peg, they were obliged to be indebted in foreign currency. And when you are indebted in foreign currency, well, somehow you lose your political sovereignty in some ways because you are uh, subject to the conditionalities of the likes of the IMF, the World Bank, and, and so on. The other thing also is that the, the way they def- they, they, um, they, um, they defend the bank is also to limit, let's say, uh, public spending and limit also the um, bank loans to the economy. That has been the standard way of defending the bank. That's why you will see on a long-term basis, all the major countries using the CFA franc uh, have been stagnating, economically speaking. You take, for example, the case of Cote d'Ivoire, which is the uh, richest country using the CFA franc. You will see that, for example, in 2016, its uh, real GDP per capita was one third lower than its best uh, level of real GDP per capita it obtained in 1978, you see. Same thing for Senegal, same thing for Cameroon, for Congo, for Gabon. That means the five biggest uh, African countries using the CFA franc. So the long-term impact has been deflationary and um, stagnation or declining income for the majority of the of the populations. And that has been the 
let's say the long-term economic impact of the CFA franc and somehow this mirrors what had happened to countries uh, in the eurozone like Greece and and so on because yeah they no longer had uh, any monetary sovereignty and in terms of in times of crisis they are obliged to adjust to what is called internal de devaluation that means austerity policies and what is uh, not known is that uh, the CFA franc countries are not nominally uh, members of the eurozone but through the peg to the euro uh, we could somehow say that yeah they are a periphery of the eurozone if i'm understanding this correctly you're saying that the, the kind of when when the french joined the eurozone the the franc was then, the the CFA franc was then pegged to the euro and um and then there is some that kind of keeps it above the level, uh, you, you know, in, in relation to other currencies than what it would otherwise be, which means that in order for uh, for African countries to make their exports more competitive, they have to undergo similar measures to what Greece did, which is um, internal devaluation. And that effectively means make everybody inside the country poorer effectively so that you you kind of attract um uh, investment you know make make labor cheap enough to attract investment from abroad is that roughly what the strategy is yeah that has been the strategy and during the debt crisis of the 1980s that has been very terrible because at that time you see that yeah it was normal that uh, uh, most currencies in the global south depreciated for example, you would see in West Africa that the currency of Nigeria, of Ghana, they would uh, depreciate because it was a way of absorbing the shock uh, through the exchange rate and not, let's say, uh, to try to minimize the damage on the real economy, you see. But in the case of the CFA franc, what happened was that those countries were really uh, over-indebted. Uh, they could not, let's say, um, obtain trade surpluses and at the same time they, they had their currency back to the French franc and at that time the policy of the French government was what what, what was called the uh, um, competitive disinflation uh, that means uh, trying to pack their currency to the um, to the mark to the German mark in order to reduce the um, inflation gap uh, with Germany and try to be, let's say, more, more competitive. That has been the strategy. So the French franc appreciated. And African countries, which were in crisis, economic crisis, you would see that their currency also appreciated because of this pact, you see. And you will see m many countries, uh, as a result, are having uh, deteriorating uh, trade balances and also deteriorating balance of payments. At the end of 1980s, you would see, for example, in some countries, the um, external debt level was uh, somehow like 300% of GDP. That was terrible. Have the French expressed any views on maybe trying to force a depreciation of the CFA franc? You know, still maintaining some the peg, the proportion kind of, a, but like just forcing it? lower or is that not discussed in fact they did it once but what, what is uh, important is that this peg is sacrosanct because uh, we do not touch the peg you could touch everything you want but you don't touch the peg why because this was a um, pillar of the colonial economy in the colonial economy the colonies should be integrated on monetary terms on banking terms with the metropolis and one way to ensure this integration is through the peg. Because when you peg your currency, well, there is no longer any exchange rate risk, for example, between the CFA franc and the French franc. And so that was something really important for the French, let's say, metropolitan capital to have no exchange rate risk. So uh, the fixed peg is something you, you do not touch. And that helps uh, limit exchange rate risk and uh, that help also when the uh, French, uh, let's say, uh, businesses obtain their, prof their profits locally in CFA franc, they could convert it into French franc uh, with no exchange rate risk. And that is really something important for them. And the French um, government uh, had a role as a so-called guarantor because, yeah, I need so-called guarantor because, yeah, you, 
we are talking about fiduciary currencies and they say that they guarantee the CFA franc that means that they guarantee the peg if for example oh, uh, the central banks we have two central banks west africa and, and central africa if they their uh, foreign exchange reserves are exhausted that means they have zero euro zero dollar etc the french treasury will provide them the desired amounts in euros before it was in Fran in, in uh, french franc you see and that means that it's a um, signal to french businesses saying that you could repatriate your profits you will no longer uh, face any limitations in terms of foreign exchange. There will be any time sufficient foreign exchange reserves and you will be able to uh, transfer your profits and dividends and so on with no exchange rate risk. And that has been the function of the CFA franc, maintaining this environment for French capital. And at the same time, the currency was born overvalued, you know. In 1945, uh, uh, when it was born, one CFA franc was exchanged with 1.70 French franc. You see, uh, three years after, it was one CFA franc against two French franc. This was not the case between, uh, uh, let's say, uh, Britain and its African colonies because they had, let's say, um, uh, exchange rate parities which were conform, uh, let's say somehow in adequation with the development level of the colonies etc you see but that was not the case uh, with the French the French did it on purpose to give African countries an overvalued exchange rate and this exchange rate has stayed the same until 1994 it has it has not been devalued between 1980, 1980 uh, 1948 and 1994 the only time it has been devalued yeah, the CFA franc will fluctuate vis-à-vis -vis the U.S. dollar, but uh, it has been it has a stable parity with the French franc uh, until 1994, and uh, since then uh, it has a stable parity with the with the euro. So you can't touch the peg, and uh, the counterparts are that you have low domestic financing of the economy, and you have also uh, structural trade imbalances. Uh, trade, 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 trade deficits, which are, let's say, somehow financed through debt in, in foreign currency. So it's a very vicious mechanism. So our friend and colleague Stuart Medina Miltimore of uh, Red MMT uh, wanted to ask about uh, Operation Purcell, where, as he puts it, France behaved like a true rogue state. Tell us about that story. Yeah, I am from Senegal. Nominally, we are an independent country. But we never had genuine independence. Why? Because there are some countries who fought using, let's say, arms to, 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 to get their independence. But we were granted independence. That doesn't mean that uh, people did not fight for independence. We had leftist people fighting for independence. But what happened was that uh, France knew that uh, independence was something inevitable in, in Africa. Because already uh, you had this... Um, uh, war of independence, for example, in Asia, for example, is Indochina, you see. Uh, Morocco and Tunisia, who, uh, who were protectorates, uh, got their independence in 1956. Uh, Ghana, 1957. So independence was something uh, that could not be avoided. But France um, told to our leaders at that time, most of them were uh, trained in, in France, and some of them even had uh, seats in the French parliament. So they were trained completely by the, by, by, by the French, uh, French um, government, etc. And uh, the French government told them, uh, I will grant you independence, but it will be an independence without all the attributes of sovereignty. That means, for example, you will have your flag, you will have five your anthem, but you will not have, a, a, let's say, a separate national currency. You will not be able to sell uh, your raw materials without my approval. Uh, you will not have an uh, independent system of education. And uh, how are leaders at that time? All of them signed that, except one guy, uh, Sekutore. Sekutore was the was a trade unionist and a president of um, of Guinea. Uh, in 1958, the French organized um, a referendum asking uh, the territories, uh, do you want independence or not? And Secretary said, no, yes, I want independence. 
But the other countries, other territories said, we want to stay with the French within the community. We would share everything with the French. And Secretary said no. You see, and somehow it, it helped uh, other territories to obtain their independence, let's say, two years later. But uh, independence obtained with so-called cooperation agreements. So these agreements covered a number of um, domains. For example, uh, regarding the currency, it was clearly stipulated that uh, you will belong to the CFA France zone. You will not have a national currency. And uh, all your reserves will be deposited with the French Treasury. You see, you could not sell autonomously your, your raw materials. You could not have an independent um, system of education. And uh, France will have a military basis in your country, etc. And they accepted all that. And when Guinea decided to issue its own national currency in 1960, uh, the French government retaliated. They organized an um, operation of sabotage called Operation Persil. And this had many... Um, dimensions one of them was to try to support the political opposition to destabilize the political regime of, of secretary uh, another aspect of this uh, operation was to inundate the Guinean economy with counterfeit banknotes and those banknotes was counterfeited by the French um, uh, uh, secret service services they counterfeited because they have their own printing presses and they counterfeited those banknotes and they disrupted the, the Guinean economy and they were really happy with that because one of the um, uh, uh, mastermind of um, this operation he was interviewed let's say decades after that and he was saying that it was a clear success and we managed to disrupt the whole Guinean economy and we sent a very powerful message to the other African countries uh, for francophone countries at least if you want to take the dangerous path taken by Mr. Secretary, you will know uh, you'll know uh, what we can do to retaliate. And this has been a powerful message. That's why most uh, Francophone countries using the Safe AFA, they never, uh, let's say, um, uh, anti um, imagine uh, issuing their own national currency because they think that this is not possible. How could we manage an independent national currency? It's not possible. And this has been the result of uh, decades of uh, repression, of intimidation, sabotage by, by the French government. Those uh, counterfeit notes entering the system on the ground that resulted in hyperinflation, is that, was that the intent? Yeah, yeah, of dis disrupting totally the economy because when you um, flood the, the economy with counterfeit banknotes, uh, people no longer have trust in the in the monetary system because they are not sure whether they have, uh, let's say, legal bank banknotes. So you you no longer have any trade, and uh, prices will, will will go up. You see, and that uh, what they uh, managed, and they were really uh, successful. Uh, yeah, the sabotage was really successful. And uh, there, there was also another example, uh, because we um, at that time we have we, we, we had good leaders. When I say good leaders, that means um, anti-imperialist leaders, leaders who loved their country, leaders who were courageous. You see, and there was a um, Malian leader, Modi Bokaita. He was a socialist leader, and he uh, let's say exited from the CFA Frank in 1962 to uh, issue um, the Malian national currency. But what happened was that uh, my country, Senegal, because we have been, let's say, the most uh, uh, let's say loyal ally of uh, French imperialist uh, actions in uh, <laughs> West Africa, you see. And uh, France and Cote d'Ivoire, uh, we decided to put trade barriers in order to suffocate Mali because Mali is a landlocked country. And all the goods, uh, normally, they transit through Senegal or Cote d'Ivoire, you see. And that has been one, um, let's say, a reprisal, uh, let's say, implemented by African countries themselves, you see. Uh, there is another example, too. It's um, the um, with Togo, because Togo had also a very progressive leader, uh, Silvanus Olympio, who was a lawyer and also an economist. He wanted to de-link de and diversify uh, relationships away from France. So he decided to issue a national currency for Togo. But just days after he took that resolution, he created a central bank. He was assassinated by some, uh, let's say, uh, soldiers who were trained in France, you see. 
and Togo never had a national currency. And you see the guy who who participate in the killing of um, Silvanus Olympio, uh, he would uh, stay in power for four decades. And after his death, he was in 2005, he was replaced um, uh, by his son, and his son is still in power. And uh, despite the protests against him, uh, France is uh, standing firm to, to back him, to maintain him in power. So this is also uh, the kind of reason which explain the longevity of the CFA franc. So a lot of what you say, obviously the events are so, a, a little bit different. Some of them are obviously more brutal, but um, it seems to me quite familiar to the attitude that has been had in the Eurozone when, when countries kind of show any degree of rebellion <laughs> or rebellious attitude. What do you think of the euro? Do you, do you think it's, it's born out of the same principles or, or is it something different? If I were to well, I say to be provocative, I would say it's an uh, improved, most sophisticated uh, CFA franc. Because at <laughs> least uh, you could say the euro is not a colonial currency. It was born after the colonial era, you see. And so it reflected somehow the will of sovereign nations. Uh, but this has not been the case with the CFA franc. But all in all, uh, they both share the, um, uh, let's say, um, the, the shortcomings of, let's say, uh, incomplete uh, monetary unions. The Eurozone is an incomplete monetary union, and it has been created, I think, to discipline governments, discipline the, the workers. That has been the purpose of the, the, the Euro. The Euro is a neoliberal currency while the CFA franc is a colonial currency. So I would say that both kind of currencies, system, they do not, um, uh, they have not been created in order to uh, serve pu pu public purpose. That has not been the case. And so you say the euro is a incomplete currency union. What would it take to complete it? Well, when I say it's incomplete, I mean that uh, it's um, currency, uh, devoid of any formal sovereign. Maybe Germany is the sovereign of the Euro because Germany uh, is the biggest uh, economy of the Eurozone. But you see, um, uh, there are currently four monetary unions across the world, four monetary unions. Three of them uh, were born during the colonial period. Uh, the two CFA franc zones, uh, the um, East Caribbean Currency Union, uh, it's the third um, monetary union, and except for those three, there is only the Eurozone, which is a monetary union that has been created after the colonial era. And you see, everywhere else, the principle is w one nation, one currency, one government, one currency. It's only the Eurozone where you find um, sovereign, uh, let's say, entities, sovereign political entities, uh, united to share a currency without a, a state backing that currency. This is an historical anomaly for me. Uh, it's an historical anomaly. That's why I say that uh, it's an incomplete uh, monetary union. Uh, if they had first, let's say, the political government of the, uh, of the European Union, maybe from there they could obtain their um, their single currency, they could have a federal treasury, and maybe it could uh, work like uh, uh, like the like like the U.S. model, because in the U.S. you have uh, um, fifty states, but you have a federal treasury. Uh, yeah, I know Stuart. Um, obviously, he's a fierce critic of the euro, and but his main point, and I, I wanted to ask Dongo where, whether he agreed with this position is that as you say the euro is a, is a currency designed to discipline workers but it dis it, it disciplines them by effectively taking away from them the decisions of how to run their own economies you see, we we see it all the time how kind of national governments it doesn't matter what government gets voted in in place, they always have to uh, bow down to the priorities of, of the central bank in, in Europe. And the central bank presumably is in technocratic hands. You know, <laughs> It's not like it's, it's run by a democratic process, by an accountable process, by any means. But a lot of people perhaps may not understand what, what you mean by sovereignty. But I think sovereignty 
it is intrinsically linked to democracy and and that's why Stuart finds it so important would you would you agree with that I do totally agree with uh, what you just said uh, without sovereignty there is no democracy and um, I would say without sovereignty you are in a kind of a colonial framework and I think that um, the way the eurozone had been designed uh, had um, let's say um, um, reduced the possibility for democratic politics uh, at least formal democratic politics in the eurozone for sure and you could understand that by uh, seeing uh, the reasons uh, the um, British government had at that time uh, uh, to not enter the, the, the eurozone because they were even if it was a let's say a, a rightist government but they were uh, really um, um, lucid about uh, the political and economic stakes in joining the eurozone uh, there, there, there had been two two main arguments for that and it's really interesting the first is that for example uh, the um, uh, Britain is you, you had the city and so that means that yeah uh, if you want to maintain this uh, place of uh, leading uh, financial place you had to have a freedom of um, capital you know capital has to freely circulate you see to attract capitals from everywhere uh, from the world and the second thing is that if you are in a monetary union in fact you are on a fixed exchange rate and with fixed exchange rate and uh, capital mobility you cannot have monetary sovereignty because this is a so-called tri tri trilemma of impossibility you could not have capital mobility uh, control of your interest rates and uh, also fixed exchange rates you could only have two out of three and the decision to join the eurozone is to uh, have capital mobility fixed exchange rate but without control on the interest rate so that means a lack of monetary sovereignty and they reviewed that and i think they were right to do that the other thing was also another type of trilemma the trilemma uh, described by, by Danny Roderick saying that you could not have, let's say, some integration within the world economy, maintain the nation state and democracy. You could not have the, the three of them. So if, if you want to integrate further in the world economy, for example, through the monetary union, and also you stay with the nation state, that means you will be in a conf configuration he called the golden straight jacket. And the euro zone has been a golden straight jacket maybe it's not golden but it has been a, a, a straight jacket so you could understand that so if you don't have your currency because your currency is the um, at least a pillar for any government to have at least a minimum in terms of financial sovereignty if you don't have financial sovereignty that means you do not have uh, any political sovereignty and so you could be subject to the blackmails of others being it uh, central banks or let's say uh, um, upon, um, the markets financial markets etc so sovereignty is really important and uh, having um, one's own currency national currency is a way at least uh, to defend your political sovereignty. We had a, a listener, uh, Jonathan Wilson, who was interested to hear about the African Union's plan to have an economic and monetary union with a single currency for all member states. How far along is that plan? Yeah, you know, what is really sad is that we have been mimicking what is happening in the Eurozone. Right. Sometimes I ask myself, uh, what do our economists, our policymakers read every morning? Because I could not understand that uh, we have all this record about the Eurozone and they are still trying to repeat the same errors as the Eurozone. You know, um, we have uh, many uh, projects in Africa of monetary union. Uh, for example, in West Africa, you have that. In East Africa too. And we have also a continental a project of a single currency for the 55 countries and you know the uh, the mindset has been the Maastricht Treaty that means the convergence criteria and so on you have a uh, deficit uh, lower than 3% uh, the uh, debt GDP ratio lower than 70% etc and so always I, I ask the question 
uh, where did you find this um, this kind of criteria? What is the economic theory behind that? What is the empirics behind that? And they don't know because everybody thinks that that is uh, good economics. And when you look at the story, you see that, um, um, in fact, those criteria of convergence, somehow they came from France. You know, the criteria of 3% of deficit, public deficit, comes from France. And it comes uh, from um, François Mitterrand. Because in um, when he came in power at the beginning of the 1980s, France was about to um, uh, cross the symbolic threshold of, let's say, uh, 100 uh, billion uh, francs. And he wanted to, um, to not to give, let's say, the extra budget uh, required by its uh, government, by some member of the government. So he asked uh, uh, some people, technical staff at the uh, French Ministry of Finance, could you please find a rule that seems, let's say, um, scientific, that I can use so that I will make the, uh, I will, I will be able to defend the austerity. You see, and the guys that uh, work on that, they say that yeah, we were thinking of two percent of uh, deficit out of GDP, but if we say two percent, um, this will uh, feel like a scam. Three is a very nice uh, number, so let's go for three percent. And they were aware that uh, the three percent of GDP. Uh, it's not economic at all, doesn't have any meaning at all, and uh, de derived, uh, let's say, 70% uh, uh, debt-GDP ratio, they know also that it has no economic meaning at all, but this has been defended by France, and after it had been exported to the Eurozone, and it has been, let's say, the macroeconomic framework of the Maastricht Treaty. So, and the German adopted that because they wanted not to be in solidarity terms with their European neighbors, uh, because the German were not really interested in joining the euro, and so uh, they say to France and the other countries, other European countries, uh, the German, uh, let's say, so-called taxpayer could accept only to be in the eurozone if they could have the assurance that. Uh, when you have your budget deficits, your trade deficit will not be there to, to help you on budgetary terms. So they, that's why they put forward those kind of, uh, let's say, silly criteria. And what is interesting is that uh, Germany, um, uh, uh, let's say, push forward this, this criteria in order not to be on solidarity terms with its neighbors, European neighbors, while African countries, in the name of African unity, solidarity, they are taking those kind of criteria as, let's say, a precondition for their own monetary association. How ironic is this situation? I mean, I, I relate it back to South American nations, and we, all, we also tend to do that. We also kind of assume that anything that the West has done um, the big countries, then it, if they've done it, then it must be a good decision, you know, and, and, and we don't, <laughs> we don't really see like what a mess. I think there are even ideas in South America for doing some s sort of joint monetary union as well. They're not as strong as in, fr in Africa, but it, it just beggars belief after the mess of the Euro, how, <laughs> how they could still go, right? Yeah, you can understand. But the actual plan to have a single currency for all the member states, you're still pretty far from that? Yeah. For example, in West Africa, it's uh, really interesting. Why? Because you see that the issue is mostly political, and it has to be political. Uh, France is not interested in getting rid of the CFA frame, despite all the criticism. I heard that they, they actually, they've kind of pretended to get rid of it or something, they just renamed it, am I right? Yeah, they renamed it. But what is interesting also yeah. about renaming is that they stole the name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they stole the name because they want to replace the CFA frame with ECHO. And ECHO is a short for ECOWAS, and ECOWAS is the Economic Community of West African States. And those 15 countries of West Africa, they decided to name their single currency project for the 15 countries ECHO. And you know, the same day, they were to decide on the fate of their single currency. The same day, it was uh, December 21st, 2019. The same day, they were to decide about the fate of their currency. 
Macron, Emmanuel Macron, the French president, and uh, Alassane Ouattara, the Ivorian president, were in Côte d'Ivoire, in Abidjan, and they said, we're going to rename the CV Franc Echo. <laughs> <laughs> that is pure theft. <laughs> but, you know, there is no banknotes on site uh, with Echo. No uh, coins on site with Echo. And there is no legal document saying that the CV Franc will be renamed Echo. Nothing at all. But then, to me, that shows that even... You know the 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 a joint currency for Africa. I think we're clear that it wouldn't be a good idea. A, a good idea is to have each each nation its own currency. But even a joint currency for the whole of Africa, France doesn't like that either. No. So there is this. We had a question. I don't know if you remember Christian a while back. We had a question on this on on this project specifically, asking whether the Echo uh, might help or facilitate in some way that kind of decoupling from the French economy. Yeah, that's the second part of Jonathan's question. Or is that is that a dead end? The way Jonathan asked it was, look, is there any way this could be less terrible than the Eurozone? <laughs> <laughs> I think we know the answer. Well, I think it would be a symbolic step. That means the delinking from the French Treasury to have, a, let's say, a single African currency. People would say that is a giant step towards Pan-Africanism, towards African unity, etc. But you see, at the same time, uh, it's like, uh, as we say, jumping from fried pan to fire. That means uh, from a colonial currency to a neoliberal Eurozone type of currency. And I say that politically it's not possible. Why? Uh, because Nigeria is the African giant. Even if it's a weak giant, but it's the African giant. Uh, Nigeria uh, represents uh, at least two thirds of the GDP of the region, West Africa. Uh, one half of the whole population. You see, Nigeria had a population of um, 200 million people. In 30 years, this population will double, you see. And everywhere in the world, all the big countries have their own currency. So we could not realistically uh, expect that Nigeria will uh, be part of a monetary union where it does not play the leading role, you see. Any monetary union in West Africa has to be, uh, let's say, a Naira bis. Uh, the Naira is a um, currency of Nigeria. So, uh, there is only one, 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 one issue. Uh, do the other countries want to have uh, as their own currency the Nigerian currency? That's it. Am I uh, right to say that if the African nations were to go down this route, that it might actually cause more frictions between the countries? Because... I have this view that in order to escape, you know, the, the neocolonialism, um, that, that developing nations need to stick together. But that sticking together may actually be more easily achieved when you have, you know, separate currencies and, and some sort of sovereignty between these countries. Yeah, that's, that's what I think too. But it's really a minority um, view. Uh, because, you know, uh, there have been so much repression from France that people, even people who know that there are issues with the, um, uh, with the, Af uh, the West African single currency that it has been modeled along the Eurozone, etc. They say that uh, if we break up, uh, France will kill us because we had many examples in the, in the past. And I think with this kind of mindset, uh, we will never escape from, from France grip. And I think the best way to delink is for a country like Senegal to say, guys, I am going to issue my national currency. And I think that if Senegal decide to do so, as a Senegal Cote d'Ivoire, uh, the CFA franc bloc, at least in West Africa, uh, would collapse. Why? Because this system is based on a scam. The scam is the so-called French guarantee. The French guarantee is a way to say that well, when the central bank is uh, devoid of any foreign exchange reserve, the French treasury will uh, lend the desired amount of foreign exchange reserve. And as a counterpart to that, the central bank uh, has to deposit at least half of its total foreign exchange reserve at the French treasury, <laughs> you see. And the French treasury is represented in the organs of the central bank with an implicit veto power. That means that the monetary policy, exchange rate policy, are decided by the French treasury. And as they decide the monetary and exchange rate policy, 
uh, the central bank will never be in a situation where it will lack a uh, foreign exchange reserve. Because before that happens, they will, let's say, strengthen the monetary policy. That means they will uh, make it much more difficult to finance the economy. And uh, in the less desirable scenario, they could uh, bring in the, the IMF, and the IMF could provide some liquidity uh, in uh, exchange for, let's say, uh, conditionalities, you see. That has been the scam. Because uh, the uh, peg to the euro has always been uh, sustained through the foreign exchange reserves of African countries and through the austerity they have been through, you see. If, for example, Senegal, which is a country uh, bringing most of the foreign exchange, says, I am no longer interested, so the other countries will not be able to defend the pack, you see. That's why I think that Senegal has to exit. Uh, also, given the fact that uh, Senegal, in the, the, let's say, in two, two, two years, will start to export oil and gas and will receive income in U.S. dollars. And we want to pack our currency to the euro. Doesn't make any sense. Any sense. So let's talk about the fight back. I understand, first of all, that there's been youth demonstrations that have had some impact, as I understand it. Could you talk about those? Yeah, yeah. Recently, uh, especially in Senegal, uh, there have been, uh, let's say, five days of anger by the youth population. Uh, the trigger was, let's say, a uh, political judiciary affair uh, uh, concerning the main political figure of the Senegalese opposition, you see. Uh, but what is of interest as, a, let's say, analyst, as an intellectual analyst, is that, uh, yeah, uh, you have to see who were on the streets. And it was the Senegalese youth, that means people between 15 years and 24 years old. and. Uh, this generation somehow does not want to be uh, sacrificed by bad economic policies. They want self-determination. And they know that uh, the Senegalese economy is, let's say, shaped in order to benefit, let's say, extraverted interests. And uh, first of all, French interests. That's why there have been many demonstrations uh, asking France to get out of the CFA franc system, etc. There have been a slogan, France dégage, that means uh, France get out of Africa. People who say that are not xenophobic, but they uh, are, let's say, um, revolted against the French imperialism. Because, you see, uh, we could not even choose the type of political leader we want because those political leaders have to be backed by Paris, you see. So that means that uh, even our so-called democracies in Africa are constrained, constrained in the fact that uh, economically we have to um, to be responsible toward France, we have to give accounts to France, and our leaders somehow have to be backed by France if they want to stay in power or have a chance to get elected. And the peoples, the young people were really angered at that. And um, because they had no jobs and they are not in school. You see, for example, the uh, 15 years old to 25 years old, 40% uh, of them uh, are neither in school nor in employment, you see. So they could not stay idle doing nothing. They have to fight back to say that we want to have another economic model. Uh, it is not only about France, but also about the neoliberal model as it is, um, let's say, um, recommended by the likes of the International Monetary Fund and the, and the World Bank. So we have to get rid of the colonial system, get rid of, let's say, the neoliberal economics, which is uh, unfortunately really dominant in the um, Department of Economics in Africa. There is total fundamentalism. When you say fundamentalism, you mean just neoclassical monetarists? Yeah, but they are much more uh, fundamentalist than the types of neoclassical neo economists you would find in the West. Oh, right, even more, right, okay. <laughs> you see, if I, because neoclassical economics is, uh, let's say, a caricature of developed countries, and we are using that caricature to teach that to our uh, students in economics. So it's a catastrophe. But unfortunately, uh, those who dominate, let's say, the policy uh, circles came from neoclassical economics. And our um, uh, policy makers, our political leaders, yeah, they only know that, that kind of paradigm. And you see the World Bank has been playing a very, uh, let's say, um, 
bad 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 um, function uh, because the, they have set up uh, an economic think tank very powerful in Kenya and uh, most of the policy makers the leading let's say economists uh, belong to this circle and they have been provided with a lot of money and they are also uh, that 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 think tank financing let's say uh, economic departments so that they could reshape their their, their curriculum so that they could only uh, to, uh, teach neoclassical economics, no heterodox economics. There is a powerful paper by uh, Professor Howard Stein on that. This paper is called Institutionalizing Neoclassical Economics. When you see that, you, you, you are disgusted. But yeah, we have to continue to, to fight. And I think that MMT could be a, a, a weapon, a very efficient weapon, uh, against the domination of neoclassical economics. Why? Because uh, in African countries, we need domestic resource mobilization. And when you sp uh, think of domestic resource mobilization, I think one of the best uh, paradigms you have is MMT. Uh, because, uh, you know, uh, in Africa, we had some resources. We have oil, gas, uranium, and so on. And uh, yeah, we say we don't have the resources. We lack money. So people come and say, you, we don't have resources, but we have money, <laughs> you see. <laughs> and with MMT, yeah, you have the contrary point of view. You have resources already, and money is yeah. never an issue. The first thing you have to ask is, how do you resource that, not how do you fund it? And I think with this type of, um, let's say, MMT mindset, we could uh, achieve, uh, I think, genuine progress. So when people say that MMT could not be applied to developing countries, I am against that point of view. Those who say that, I think they are Eurocentric somehow. Even if it is people from the global south, I think they are Eurocentric. Because the best test for MMT is not a policy test, but an analytical test. Uh, if people say that MMT could not be applied, I ask them, tell me what, pa what paradigm, what theoretical approach could uh, help explain uh, what the anthropologists call monetary transition. That means the transition from indigenous currencies to, let's say, colonial currencies. If there is a paradigm better than chartalism, better than MMT, I don't know that paradigm. You know? And yeah. when you see that, you know that um, MMT could be useful on a number of regards for African countries and the global south in general. Fadel Kaboub usually talks about common traps that um, that developing countries uh, um, fall into. Um, what do you think these traps are and um, how do you think MMT could help developing countries navigate outside of these traps? Yeah, yeah. Fadil is a, is a friend and he is doing a wonderful job. It's his birthday today, actually. <laughs> oh! <laughs> Happy birthday, uh, Fadel, if you follow us. <laughs> yeah, and, and also happy belated birthday yeah. by the time this goes out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He identified a number of traps. And you know, the, um, for example, the trap of um, being in, the, um, uh, let's say, a, a, division, a global division of labor when you only export, uh, let's say, commodity products of low value added manufacturing. You see, this would create. This will generally create trade deficits, and that means uh, debt in foreign currency, uh, foreign debt investment. You see, because people tend to think that yeah, if you attract foreign debt investment, that will uh, help you develop. But no, generally, because foreign debt investment, when you ha do not design it properly, selectively, well, it will just let's say pump out your surplus, your economic surplus. That means uh, they will invest uh, $100 and five years after the initial investment, they'll go out with $1,000, you see. That is pumping out the, the surplus. And that what uh, foreign debt investment uh, has been doing in Africa because it has been localized mainly in the mining and the hydrocarbon sectors, you see. So it's just a way of pumping out the, 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 the economic surplus. Tourism also could be a trap. Uh, Fadel does not say that you have to stop tourism, but you say that if you don't have food sovereignty, well, if you attract more tourism, that means that you have to feed them, and that means that you have to import more food, and this will create uh, tensions on your trade balance, you see. And uh, when you also liberalize finance, 
in order to attract let's say more um, let's say um, finance for your own development that also is a trap because after at the end what you will have is much more financial instability you see so Farrell has identified all those traps and you see the common denominator is the idea that African countries do lack money and that's why that's why MMT is really powerful because MMT says look first at real resources and after that we talk about money do you have the real resources good you don't need foreign currency for that if you have the real resources you can build your schools you can build your hospitals you can give jobs to people you do not need the IMF you do not need the World Bank and I think this view is really empowering and liberating and I think much more people should be uh, exposed to the MMT view uh, on development MMT view on developing countries so that leads us perfectly into, the, into possibly our last question, which is, tell us about the movement for monetary sovereignty in Africa, the conference and, and the letter and, and everything. This is um, an initiative uh, we had uh, in the, uh, 2019 to organize the first edition in Tunis. Uh, we were, let's say, five. Uh, there was Fadel, of course. There was uh, my Tunisian colleague who introduced me to MMT, Maha Ben Gada. Uh, my friend and uh, co for Kai Kodenbrook, uh, and also a um, colleague from Tunisia, uh, Ines Mahmoud. We organized this first edition in uh, November 2019 because uh, we thought it was important to have this uh, discussion in Africa about economic and monetary sovereignty. There have been three, three uh, let's say, triggers. First, there was the crisis of the Eurozone, what happened to the likes of Greece and so on. Uh, second, there was the protest against the CFA franc, people asking for monetary sovereignty, like myself. And there was also all those debates about MMT. That was really fascinating. And we saw that we could create, um, let's say, uh, a framework where we could invite people from the global north, from the global south, to discuss about economic and monetary sovereignty. And it had been a success, I think, because we had very interesting debates. And uh, normally with uh, Pluto Press, we will uh, release a, a book, a collective volume, with uh, some of the um, presentations um, during that conference. Normally this year we uh, should have uh, organized the second edition of this conference, but due to the pandemic, we will postpone it uh, probably to next year. Is there anything else that uh, somebody listening to this that wants to get involved in this struggle should uh, do or, or become interested in uh, Nodongo? Well, I think uh, what, what you are already doing, uh, uh, giving me this opportunity to speak about the CFA Frank, my work, what is happening on Africa, it's really important because we need uh, international solidarity. You know, most of the progress uh, let's say political progress, symbolic progress about the CFA Frank was possible only through international solidarity. Uh, you know, in the Francophone sphere, this um, topic has been a taboo. Nobody would like, nobody talked about it. And you know, and when we include, let's say, France from, let's say, English speaking world, you know, that gives the contestation against the CFA Frank another dimension. You know, this could no longer be a taboo, this could no longer be a secret. So I think it's really important to have such kind of initiatives like, like this. And I am really uh, grateful for, for such an opportunity. We need to uh, unlike the conversation and uh, try to know what is happening everywhere and try to build uh, solidarity networks so that we could uh, uh, strive to obtain economic and monetary sovereignty for the peoples, the ordinary peoples. It's definitely our pleasure. Absolutely. We're very lucky to have you here. Thanks so much for your time, Dodongo. Keep well. Yeah, you too. Bye. Ciao. Bye bye. That was the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Don't forget, you can support the show through Patreon, starting at a dollar a month, and get access to patron-only episodes. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash mmtpodcast. You can also find me on Twitter at mmtpodcast, and you can find Patricia on Twitter at Patricia N. Pino. And you can email us at mmtpodcast at outlook.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope to hear from you.